Well, welcome to the Pack Improv Podcast. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank the people for showing up. Thank you for showing up tonight. Uh, my guest, of course, is Dana Powell. Now, I've known you for, a, what, about 12 years, something like that? At least, yeah. Because uh, we met at the I.O. Yes. The I.O. West here in here in Los Angeles. Yeah, I was just telling someone before this that I... I'm from Missouri, so I never studied in Chicago, but I was out here already before you were, and I was in classes, and everybody was like, Miles is coming, Miles is coming, Miles is coming, and I got you for my last level. I was very lucky. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. I, I, I remembered that I, I, I taught you. Yeah. It just seems like so long ago. Yeah. Uh, and many been, years. Many years ago. Mm -hmm. And you've done so much since. I yeah, I've been very lucky. Looking up your IMBD, and you were in Bridesmaids, I and was, yes, with Modern Family, and yes. just a whole slew of stuff. Yeah, uh, I'm very jealous. I play Eric Stone Street's sister on Modern Family. Eric Stone Street, who I taught in Chicago. Yes, exactly. Uh, he's a great guy. I remember in Chicago, he was telling me he went to Northwestern, I think, and they had a thing at Northwestern about. I think the bunking, or the, no, I think maybe I was telling him that because he did a commercial where he had to be purple. Yeah, he people still remember him for that. Oh yeah, I still remember. Yeah, that. <laughs> yeah, he, his entire body, right? Yeah, his entire yeah. body, purple. Yeah, acting the fool, cash in the check. Yes, he's still cashing checks. <laughs> yes, he is. He's, he's doing well. He's that doing Eric very Stone well. Street. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you're from Missouri. Yes. Right. So you mm -hmm. came, did you did you do improv in Missouri at all, or did you start when you got to L.A.? You know, I did short form in Missouri. Um, I went to school for theater. I have a BFA in theater. And uh, where'd you go to school? <laughs> um, at the time, it was called Southwest Missouri State. Now it's Missouri State. They have a great theater program. Uh, John Goodman went there. Whatever, bunch of people. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. Brad Pitt's from my hometown. <laughs> um, anyway. Hey, I want all of Missouri listening. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we did short form and the people I did it with were kind of the rebels of the department. And so they called themselves the rusty trumpets because we had a professor that was like, don't party too hard. It's like leaving your trumpet out in the rain. And they were like, we smoke lots of pot. Let's call ourselves the rusty trumpets. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. <laughs> don't party too hard. It's like leaving your trumpet out in the rain. Yes, because your body is your instrument. Right. I was thinking I want to... It's funny how you, a, a teacher will have a saying like that that sticks with, with you for the, the rest of your Forever. life. Forever. Yeah. Right. I can't remember history facts, but I remember my rusty trumpet. I remember, for some reason, it makes me think of a, I had a teacher in high school, a history teacher, I think, named Mr. Lotkis or Lotki. I can't quite remember, but I remember he was, he was an Armenian guy, and he was like the only Armenian guy that I'd ever met in my life. <laughs> in your life. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and he used to dance around and just talk I spent a lot of time talking about how superior he was because he was Armenian oh my goodness uh, but it was hysterical it was all in in good fun mostly taking shots at himself but I mean I, I, I always remember that uh I had a teacher that got suspended for wrapping his boogers in scotch tape and flicking them at us <laughs> that's not a joke wait a minute if a, if a booger is wrapped in scotch tape how do yeah. you flick it? oh you flick the whole thing the whole thing it's hard yeah I was imagining trying to flick the booger off the scotch tape and how that's just not going to work. No, it would stick. The scotch tape is very sticky. Yeah. It's a package. He makes it a package. Makes it a package and yeah. flicks it at you. <laughs> yeah. I think I think that's awesome. He got suspended. He got suspended. But not fired. No, no, no. No, no. Because it's, it's right there. That's the message. It's yeah. okay. That's an okay thing to do. <laughs> so you were doing short form in Missouri. Yeah, we were doing short form in Missouri. And then I moved to L.A. never having been here in my life. I'd never been away from my parents more than eight days. <laughs> so I moved out here. I followed a boy. And um, Steve Fight, I think you had him as a student. You've had so many students. But he was like, you got to go see this. And I had never seen long, long form before. And I was like, I have to learn how to do that. What did you see? I don't know. It was something at the complex. Yeah, because back. I want to say it was the Deconstruction Derby. Mm, I doubt that because. I don't think the deconstruction was out here yet. Uh, I don't know. Because we had, I don't know, maybe, maybe they're done. I remember because the, the I.O. originally was here at the complex. At the complex, uh -huh. uh, There's a lot of good people in that crew. So you had Pete Gardner, Paul Valancourt. Pete Gardner was my first teacher. Keckner was playing yeah. with those guys back then. Yeah, a whole bunch of good people in, in, in that crew. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because when I got out here, they were still here. Yes. Uh, and I think the next year they moved the up to the I.O. West in Hollywood. Yeah. 
all right, so you saw you saw some long form. You started and I was studying. Like, I gotta learn that. And then you said, "Screw this! I'm just gonna do hit TV shows." <laughs> well, I've been very lucky to do some of that stuff. <laughs> Yes. That's where you make money. You don't do improv for money. Oh yeah, I do. I just it's, it's who it's, pays it's, you? No one, no one at oh, all yeah. pays me. But I still I do it for the money. Yeah, that's but it the, just that, never. I, comes. That's the reason I, I got in it. I, I just kept thinking this is going to pay off big, real big. Uh, and I figured if I just put in enough time, and I'm 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 still investing. I'm still investing still, that time. You're still going. The, the money's going to start rolling in. You know uh, what? Persistence and talent. There you go. You got it. <laughs> I have, I, I definitely have persistence. I, I definitely have been doing this a long time. Uh, are you doing any improv nowadays? Are you playing yeah. anywhere? Yes, actually, I do a show with Eric Stone Street and Mike Bunin called uh, "Who Is Debbie Powell?" Because when I met him, he loved to pretend that my name was Debbie Powell to people I knew, so that they would think he didn't know me very well, um, <laughs> just to embarrass me. Um, so we do a show once a month, and I think we're going to start traveling and do the San Francisco Sketch Fest. Where's and, that at? Uh, I O. At I O. Mm -hmm. All right. That sounds I do fun. That. Sometimes I do the Armando. Right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. I do the Gas Show at the Groundlings. Do you do the do you, do you play in the cast with Armando, or do you prefer to do the, the monologues? No, I've only done the monologues once. I play in the cast. Yeah, yeah. The the monologues are always interesting to me because I, I, when I did it, I always liked the monologist who was you know real. Yeah. Rather than someone who was particularly fun. I remember uh, what's his name, Patton Oswald, would do the Ar Armando sometimes. Oh. And he would you know he would start like whatever the suggestion was. He'd he'd start with it, and then pretty soon. It became pretty, you know, pretty polished stuff he was saying. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. He'd, 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 he'd twist it into stuff he already had in his head. And oh, wow. Basically, I mean, it was all very funny. Of course. Because he's a very funny man. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, all right, great. Now we have to deconstruct the joke, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's like, you already told the punchline. Yeah, so what do we have yeah, to play with? Now we have to do a scene based on your punchline. Better uh, than you just did it. Right. But that was actually better than I remember. I, I can't remember who it was, and it's probably good. We had one monologist who was so just patently boring. Uh -huh. I mean, just like the, the opening monologue was about two and a half minutes of just nothing. I mean, I literally, you could tell the cast was like, there's nothing. You, they, they didn't give us anything. Oh, no. How can someone be that uniformly boring? boring? And I remember the first scene I did was just about a guy who was super boring. Oh, uh, did that guy get it? Uh, I think he probably got it a little because the show improved as, as, as it went on. But the, to me, I was like, the reason this scene worked in the room was because it was in the room. The audience was aware that that guy was boring. Yeah. So me doing, the audience was, the reason they laughed when I started being boring was like, because they made the connection. Right. They were uh, like, we think that guy's boring too. Yeah. So because to me, if, if it's, I've always thought like if, if it's in the room, you know, it's fair game. If we're all aware of it. Yeah. Uh, that's why, like, you see, you see so often, like, if someone's phone rings. Yeah. Right? You yeah. use it because everyone heard it. Yeah. You don't always have to use it. And I, I don't want to, you know, use every tiny little thing. But right. that guy was boring. <laughs> I he, love that he you're so coming. honest. You know, can I tell something about you that makes me laugh? <clears throat> sure. <laughs> so, you were my teacher, and you didn't know anybody in our class's names because... <laughs> You kind of, I think, probably thought we were lost causes, most of us. But anyway, you did know my name, but you, this is how you said my name. And I was like, I liked it because I was like, he knows me. <laughs> but at the same time. <laughs> Debbie this, Paul. <laughs> Debbie, you called me Debbie. <laughs> no, you would go, Dana. And I was like, that's exactly what he thinks of me. He thinks Dana. <laughs> <laughs> but I loved it. I thought it was really funny. I just love that you're like, here's what I think. And you say it. Right. Well, it's funny because I, I remember that reminds me of the thing. Like if I, if I do that with someone's name, like Dana, it's actually a way for me to mnemonically. Memorize it? Re remember it. I, yeah. I associate it with that. Uh, and it's funny because I've, I've had different times in my life. Like cause I try and make a point of learning all my students' names. But by the end of the first class, I teach now. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's hard, <clears throat> I think. It's actually, it's really easy. All you have to do is bother to. Oh, uh, it's just, you, know, you sit there and you go, all right, your name's this, your name's this, your name's this. You know, all right. So I, 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 I know the names. Uh, 
but I, I'm sure there were. T- I, I, I remember, and it wasn't a lot, but I remember there were probably a, a couple of years in there where I was just like, "Fuck your names." Yeah, I'm sick well, of all your names. Plus, you had just gotten out here, and you were like, "I think you were like, how did these kids get to this level?" <laughs> You're at this level, really? Oh boy! All right, I'm not going to learn your names. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I'm going to express my rage. <laughs> At you sitting in front of me. Because I'm only going to refer to as you. You. You, you. you and that guy. Go up you. there. Do something. You and that guy. Do a scene. <laughs> but I remember you were good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. I, mean, I remember in, right away you, you were good. And you, and you played right away too, didn't you? I, I mean, did, yeah. You got up pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's good. I mean, that doesn't happen to a lot of people. Yeah. But I think I was lucky, I think. But you know what? I also interned and I... Because because of the way this place was set up, I saw tons of shows because right. I was working the box office and you could see right into the stage. And like, I think that's such a great way to learn. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. So I just watched and watched. I was like a sponge. I still feel like I'm that way with still learning things. I, I never feel like, oh, I've done so much. I shouldn't have to. Like when I went over to the <clears throat> Groundlings, everybody was like, ask if you can start in an upper level or UCB. And I was like, no, I'm, I want to learn everything and i don't have any laurels to rest on right you know i just want to be a sponge i think it's great that you can you know, you you know to learn from watching yeah just because it's funny to me because you know when i started there was not a lot of improv in the world yeah but i remember like i was you know early at every class i saw every show i could possibly see uh you know i watched at any given opportunity I, I watched as much as i could yeah and out you know out here in particular in particular mm-hmm. uh it seems in, in in los angeles it's you know sometimes it's like pulling teeth yeah to get people to watch shows yeah, it's like watch you know watch shows it's like people do shows but they don't but they don't want to watch they don't want to watch well them. they make it requirements for classes now well some places do i i, I think that's to me i, I, I don't want to have to it's like you telling have someone to, to telling but... some adult to brush their teeth it's like yeah you got to brush you you should brush your teeth. Yeah. Like you want to get better at improv? Watch, Watch some it. shows. Watch it. Yeah. Oh. And good and bad. People are like, I don't want to see bad improv. It's like you'll learn no matter what. Oh yeah. Because if you if you watch the bad stuff, you say, all right, that that I know not to do that. Yeah. And, you know, and it, I see it, it, why they tell me not to do this or why to make a certain decision or you know. Yeah. Either, there's no rules, but you see what works and what doesn't. Right. It 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 it, it reinforces a lesson, or you see something new that you can take back to class and go, hey, what was that? Yep. For sure. Uh, yeah, so everyone should watch more shows. Yeah. Because that would make the houses a lot more fun to play it's in front true. of. It's true. But at the same time, like, I, I, I don't like having to say, like, hey, you have to watch shows. Yeah. I, uh, I know it's like, to me, it's like, these are adults, and it's like, like I have children, and you have a child yes. now, too, Henry, yes. four-year-old boy. Uh-huh. Uh, and I have a daughter who's playing ukulele, and... It's at an age where I'm just like, all right, it's time to practice. You know, I'll yeah. tell I'll tell her to go practice, and she's not fighting it a lot, but you know, she'd rather not. But as a parent, I'll be like, okay, I'm gonna make you practice, you know, a little bit. Yeah. If you hate it, then fine, stop playing, and I'll it. stop shelling out the cash for the lessons. Uh, but she's eight. Yeah, but I know, but 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 she's eight, so I mean, I'm I'm willing to take the responsibility of like, all right, I'm gonna push you a little bit because you don't know yet how much this will pay off for you down the road. Right. Whereas an adult, I don't want to take some. 22 year old person and say you have to go watch a show yeah because i'm your dad right uh <laughs> and this is what's good for you yeah i mean you should just do it because it's the right thing to do and as a performer you can always tell those people because they're mad about being there like i was in sunday company over at the groundlings for a year and a half and i could always in the front couple of rows tell when there were students that didn't want to be there there because they had their arms crossed and they were like prove yourself to me all over their faces. I hate that. It's like, dude, you've been up here before. You know, like, just just support. That's all. You don't have to think I'm the best thing since sliced bread. You don't right. even have to think I'm funny, but just don't be a... Don't be a dick. Thank you for saying right. it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> don't just sit there judging. Yeah. It's my, I've had that experience because any class I've ever taught, the first time I get a group of people in front of me, mm-hmm. you know, I look at them and I'm like, I don't know any of you people. Right. I don't know your skill levels at all. And, and you can see, and, and they don't know me either. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's that, I'm, I'm talking, but 
And I can see they're like, what's this guy going to do? Yeah. What's going to happen? Is this going to be any good? All right, let's see. And I can see that sort of faint judgment, that air of judgment about them. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do now is almost immediately the first class I get people is like, all right, go up on stage, do some scenes. Like have them play right away. Just like get up on stage, play, show me some stuff. And inevitably, you know, the scenes they do aren't killer because they're in class to learn. Right. But then now they're all back sitting in their chairs and they just, you know, they just put their work on stage. Yeah. And I just took a look at it. Yeah. And so now it's like they're a little less judgmental of me. Oh, yes. They're a little more receptive to, yeah, that's... that's well, I need to learn that's something. What, that's what I just did. I should uh, go see a show. <clears throat> you should go see a show, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's funny because it, it's, it's not like... I'm, it's not like a power thing. I just want them to say, all right, so there, you're playing right away. Mm. I, think, I think one of the fears a student has in classes, and they go into like, am I going to get on stage? Because mm. I, I know that it's happened. I've been in them, and I've heard about it from a lot of students where you're in a class where it's so big, and the teacher maybe spends too much time talking mm. that you only get on stage like maybe once or twice during the class. I see. Uh, and that can be f frustrating depending on the person who's talking, I suppose. Yeah. Like, can they spew gold for three hours? Or probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Uh, probably get those people on stage a little more. Yeah. Um, yeah. I forget what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was talking about class, and I just I, I I drifted off. I was thinking about gold. Oh God, who doesn't? I, I said gold, and I thought about that's gold. why you're doing improv. That's why I'm doing improv. Yeah. I remember I was I reading reading some article about some old guy who buried like a, a, a like a, some sort of metal container like full of gold and jewels uh worth you know a million or more dollars right he's he's old and dying and rich yeah so he just took a bunch of his shit put it in the middle and hid it in like the country somewhere mm -hmm. and he wrote a poem that's a map to find it oh and people have been looking for it for like 30 or 40 years really? trying to figure out this nobody's ever found no it. one nobody's ever found it why do old people bury shit all the time <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, just thought, I just thought, what a wonderful, because it's, it's, it's money I'm sure he doesn't need. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't do that. But he's, he's you know, an old Western guy. Like, I'll bury this in the mountains and let's see if, because someone someday is going to find this thing and it's going to be like, just, just imagine that the child in any one of us, if you stumbled upon a box full, a treasure box, basically. Yeah. A fucking bo jewels and coins and just. But I feel like the time that we live in, I would immediately be like, oh, John Stossel's going to come out and see if I make the right decision. It's just some fucking drug <laughs> dealer's stash. Yeah. <laughs> I can't take this. I'll be dead in an hour. Yeah. <laughs> I better leave it here. That's sad. Oh. <laughs> that, you, just, you just made me really sad about what, what I thought was a fun little I story. I the little kid in you. <laughs> <laughs> you did. You crushed sorry. the child in me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I will not look for that gold now. Oh, no. What's going to happen, what I hope happens, which I imagine probably will, because it's been 30 years people have been looking for this thing and they can't find it. Okay. Uh, I mean, spending way too much time and money. And trying, money. Yeah, trying to find this thing. And what's going to happen is some idiot's going to trip over it or something. And he's just going to, hey, a box of gold. Yeah. <laughs> and then and these other people. <laughs> I'm going to buy four more bars. Like, yeah, he's going he's to stumble up upon it and have it. And then these other people are all just going to fucking kill themselves because they spent the last 35 they fucking dedicated years. dedicated their lives. Yeah, just it. Just trying to find, they spent so much time trying to find it, and then some idiot just fell on it. Yeah, that would be the worst. I would be angry about that. Yes, I, I, I would. Like I would people, take great joy in that. When people win the lottery, you would take great joy in it. When people win the lottery and they're like, "Take my picture," and they want to be like, they want to be out there about it. I'm like, "You oh, tell yeah. me, go find a lawyer. Don't tell anybody." Like yeah, I have never. all these rules about when I win the lottery. It makes me think you may have won the lottery. I what? <laughs> It just sounds like you're saying that maybe you won the lottery and you're not I mean, telling anybody. I live, I'm, I live very beneath my means. But that could be on purpose. Yeah. To hide your lottery wealth. Yeah. I'm so rich that I drive a Hyundai. You're saying that like it's a joke. <laughs> I wish. This is a deep cover you have. There would be like a twinkle in my eye instead of this sadness. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sadness in your eyes. No, I'm pretty happy. <laughs> you won the lottery. I bet you won. The, you're a secret lottery winner. I'm going to research this. Uh, all right. I'm going to actually open it up to uh, questions. Any questions from anybody here? Yes. Um, you went through both Iowa and Ground Lakes? I did. And did you, did you find that experience different? I mean, is it, is it's it, very different. 
It is. Um, so I the also, question is how, you know, you went through IO and Groundlings. How did you find the experience different? Yeah, it, um, it's very different. I started at IO, so that this always feels like my home. Um, You're saying this, like, because this is an IO. Oh, I know. No, I know. Uh, it feels like it because I started here. It, I, I, I probably still smell like the IO. I spent so much time here. <laughs> um, but I went over to the Groundlings. Um, the difference for me, experience-wise, was that uh, over there, they're very much about big characters and a lot now – different places offer writing programs but at that time UCB wasn't out here yet you know nobody was really offering writing so as you go through the groundlings program I think now they're set up where it splits off you can do either or both whatever but um at the time that was sort of the only place I had to go for more writing um so and it gets very intense towards the end people I'll say this people talk a lot of crap about the groundlings and say oh it's so political and it's so all these things it is what you make it. I'll tell you that. In the end, whoever gets on main stage, there's definitely different things that go into it. But I have zero regrets. I It was trial by fire. I went into that program not feeling like a writer, but I came out knowing that I was. So that's what I would say about that. Whereas um, starting at I.O., the benefit of that place was I was able to get on stage quickly. Even, you know, student, just student stuff. I, I was very lucky and got on a Herald team pretty quickly. But even before that, I was doing cage matches. And then older students and performers saw me and they were like, oh, she's fun. Do you want to come play with us? And, you know, that the community of Iowa West was, was much more than Groundlings. Groundlings is a little bit like who's in your class and the main company. There's a much, much stricter hierarchy i also studied at ucb just for a little bit when they first moved out here i was in matt besser's first class they asked like 15 people to do it and i was on the first herald team over there and the difference for me over there was i do a lot of character work and they're very smart <laughs> i'm not i'm not as reference heavy and smart as they are so i was always like oh like seth morris told me one time i was milk toast i was like hey come on now <laughs> right i know i was saying that's that's, that's I was what I was thinking about was how the the community difference between improv uh, and like groundlings. That I'm not even sure that I would consider them like an a, an improv house. They're more of a, no, a sketch I house. Either. Yeah, they uh, have a couple of improv shows, but they're more. And it's, it's so different because I think of the same thing in Chicago. Like the Second City, when I was there in Chicago, was more like there was the Second City, you know, people who were mainly the people who were on the stages. Yeah. And the student community, there wasn't a real community. Again, it was who's in my class. Yes. Uh, and I think, I was think that made me think of it's this, been the same kind of thing like when I've done plays. Mm. Like a play is like, well, who's in the cast? That's, yeah. It, it's not like the, 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 the community of actors hangs out. Right. Uh, I'm sure there is that, but I don't think there's anything quite like that, quite as much like that as there is in the improv community. Right. Or it's a, it's a much larger community, uh, even between theaters. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people who, who know each other, who hang yeah. out, who go to the same places. Right? Yeah, a lot of crossover. Yeah. And that's actually how I got my career going, to be perfectly honest. Like, we joke about improv not making us money and stuff. But, you know, I moved out here. I'm just some kid from Missouri that moved out here. I don't have any Hollywood connections or anything. And I met people in the improv community that asked me to do little projects with them. And they were like, you know, you get to know them and you show what you can do or whatever. And then I got asked to be in a pilot. And then I got asked to be an assistant to someone and like all of these things. And then you weren't so much milk toast anymore. That's were right. You? That's right. <laughs> but that community is what. You should send him some fucking milk toast. God. Milk toast. Here's, here's your milk toast. <laughs> He's a really nice guy, but he was like, you kiddo out. Um, wow. Um, it blows. Yeah. I love, I love UCB. I've done shows over there and and stuff since then right. but I, I haven't been as involved but partially probably my choice because I really loved the community of IO and you know I made friends at the Groundlings and like I said there is a lot of crossover so all right yeah. great anything else yeah um, so we love Modern Family it's such a popular and iconic show can you tell us about maybe one of your first days on that show and what it was like to step onto that set Oh, yeah. Well, the first time. No, no, I got it. <laughs> it was an interesting experience for me because um, I am such good friends with Eric. Um, and, I, and I'm and i sure a lot of people in our community are like, oh, he handed that to her, which 
if you guys are it does in the industry, it does not work that way. Yeah. It, it was, works that way. I'm pissed off at most everyone I know. <laughs> exactly. So, and then also I had, also my husband is the production supervisor of Modern Family. So he was trying to keep it on the down low that we were married so that that would not play a part in it in any way. So, um, yeah, the first the first day that I worked, the air conditioning had broken down, and Eric was not happy about that. So it started off a little bit like, oh, oh boy, this is uncomfortable. Um, but to be honest, everyone was so kind, and everyone is so funny and nice. I I loved the show before I was a fan before I was on it, and so it was almost like I can't believe this is happening right now. Um, I've known Eric for a little bit longer than you, and I met him through one of my improv teachers, and so he's always been sort of my big brother. He's been a mentor to me, and for me, it was a huge moment to be able to work with him in that capacity, um, so it was like kind of a dream come true. I mean, I had certainly had worked before that, and I'm grateful for every job, but that one was a little bit personal to me because it was my husband's show, and it was kind of my coming out as his wife. Uh, he works in production, and, you know, production kind of hate us. We're like meat puppets. We're dumb and make their jobs harder. So, but this way, he didn't have to go, oh, my wife wants to be an actress. It was like, no, that's my wife. She's doing this, you know. Um it, it's a set that runs like that. You know, they know what they're doing and it's quick. Um, they're just good at it. It's a well-oiled machine. And I just stepped right in and was able to go along for the ride. It was really fun. That sounds like you had an awful time. Yeah, terrible. <laughs> I also made Eric when they wrapped me on my first episode. I texted him. I was like, I'm getting ready to wrap because it was a scene, I think, with me and Phil. And um, I was like, you better come clap for me because, you know, when they go, that's a wrap on Dana. Everybody's like, oh, right. thanks, Dana, for coming. And he was like, I'm busy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so everybody was like, bye, Dana. You know, I'm sure we'll see you again, whatever. And then like two seconds later, Eric comes out around the corner and he's like, oh, did I miss it? And I was like, I know you were standing back there. I know it. So I marched him back out into the middle of a video village. And I was like, excuse me, everyone. Eric would like to clap for me. It's a wrap on data. I made, I made him clap for me. That's fine. I remember the first time I ever, I mean, I, I did, a, a, I had a couple lines on some show. I can't remember. But I'd never seen that thing you're describing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just there to do two lines. I'm a construction worker. I say a couple lines. Yeah. But I guess you're speaking, so they do that. Yeah. So when I'm wrapped, you know, the director's like, all right, everybody, that's, that's a wrap. And he's talking and brings me out. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? <laughs> right? He says, that's, you know, that's, that's a wrap on Miles. And everyone starts clapping. And, I, and I, I'm just sitting there like, you people don't know me. <laughs> like, I, I, I met like two of you today. Yeah. And like, no one here knows. Why are you doing I was, I was, I remember thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen in oh my, my life. God. That just shows the difference between me and you. You're <clears throat> like, this is dumb. I'm like, no, everyone <clears throat> has to clap. Go well, get Eric. <laughs> I, 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 I think in my mind, at some level, I'm like, why are these people fucking with me? <laughs> it's like, I, I think the director's fucking with me. He, <laughs> he didn't like what I did or something. And now he's doing this thing where everyone claps because I'm leaving. Uh,. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, it was, I, I didn't say any of this. Right, of course. But it was, but that's all, going it was, all, it was all there. I had a director on a show once. He hated me so much. He hated me. I don't know why. He has to approve me, you know? Yeah. But anyway, he was, I could tell you mean things he did. But the thing that blew my mind was he was blocking a scene that I had a line in, and we were at the front door of the family's house on stage, and he literally closed the door in my face. And started blocking the scene. And I, and I, inside the house without me. And I turned to the camera guys and I go, what the fuck is going on? And they were like, you need to knock on the door. And I was like, his body weights against it. Like he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> and so after he blocked the scene, I came in and do you know um, Todd Stashwick? Yeah. He was in it with me. And I was like, dude, he locked me out on the porch when we just blocked the scene. He was like, follow me. <laughs> so I literally shot my scene without ever being blocked by the actor. <laughs> and he was so mean to me in other ways that at one point the makeup lady came up to me and she goes, honey, you need to calm down because you are breaking out in hives. Oh, Jesus. And she was like putting makeup on me. Oh. That guy's a dick. <laughs> I can't. I've Whoever blocked his was. name. I know. I can't even remember. Well, it's probably good that you don't. I love that. 
We don't like to spew too much hate. No, 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 no. Except the general kind of hate. Right. Like the hate I have for secret lottery winners, which I know you are one of. Admit it. You're smiling. You're smiling right now. I always smile. It masks everything else. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for. So let's do a set.